So it's a great pleasure and privilege to have a talk, a chance to talk to Eric Hobsbawm. Eric, I, I will start by asking when and where you were born. Uh, I was born in Alexandria, Egypt, mm -hmm. with which I have absolutely no personal connection. My only connection is, as it were, through official documents, from which I have never been able to escape, <laughs> because they contain... I was registered at the British Consulate in Alexandria, and my birth certificate contains two errors with which I've had to live forever. What and one, they misspelled my name, and B, they got the date of my birth one day wrong. <laughs> <laughs> the misspelling of the name meant that you weren't Hobsbawm with a U, was it? or B-A-U-M was, was the name of the family. Mm. What it was originally something else. Mm. My suspicion is it was Obstbaum. Mm. Uh, it's the only thing. Mm. But there is no way of um, verifying this. Mm. What effect is being one day older or younger than you should be, what effect has that had on your life? The only effect is that I have to live with what it says on my documents, not yeah. with what I know to be true. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, tell me ab uh, about uh, as far back on your uh, either your mother's or your father's side as you like to go. Some people go back to the Norman Conquest, but um, you don't need to go that far. But your grandparents or...? Yes. Um, my I don't think I can trace it better back to beyond the grandparents. On the other hand, on my father's side, my grandparent was probably born around 1838, died in 1927. Uh, he was uh, a Jewish um, cabinet maker by trade. Uh, he migrated to England in the early 70s, between 1872 and 1874. Uh, he was already a widow then. He migrated with the daughter of his first marriage and with one child of his second marriage. And the rest of uh, my uncles and father were then born, already born in England from 1870 on. Where did they migrate from? Um, so far as I'm aware, Warsaw. Hmm. Uh, and for a particular reason, or push or pull, or there's no way. We, hmm. I mean, we simply don't know. I mean, hmm. he died before I knew him. Hmm. The rest of the family didn't really know very much about it either, hmm. or didn't want to talk about it. Uh, <coughs> uh, might have been for any reasons, except he did begin, he did migrate before the main migration from Eastern Europe, the Jewish migration from Eastern Europe started. Mm. Uh, <coughs> first registered in the census in 1881, mm. as usual misspelled the name because it's the most incredibly misspelling name. Yes. Huh? Almost impossible. Uh, I've kept it only uh, largely out of uh, uh, out, out of principle. Mm. And because in, in order nobody should suggest that I uh, changed a name which conceivably sounded Jewish. You mm. see. So, otherwise, it would certainly have, if we'd still lived in an oral society, it would have gradually, so to speak, weathered down into either Hobson or Osborne or something like that. Mm. Huh? But it, it didn't. <laughs> mm. uh, and so we, we, my family has been stuck mm. with this odd thing, including the initial H, mm. which I suspect came originally because my father must have landed in London, and as he was illiterate in English, anyway, mm. he must have dictated his name, 
and the name Hobsbawm would obviously acquire an H when taken down by mm. a Cockney mm. customs officer. Mm. Whatever it is, anybody with an H in this name is a dis direct descendant of my grandfather. Mm. Uh, my grandmother died much, much younger, much long before I was born. Uh, on my mother's side, my grandfather was somewhat young. I was born about 1869 or thereabouts. The family, they weren't really allowed to go into Vienna. Jews weren't allowed into Vienna before the 1840s, except for a small uh, privileged minority. Uh, <coughs> They originally came from this curious area, roughly where Austria and Czechoslovakia and Slovakia and Hungary meet. Uh, in various areas around, probably the Moravian side rather than the Hungarian side or the Slovak side. But for them anyway, it's, um, but by the time that I knew anything about the family, they had migrated to, to Vienna. <coughs> My father's family remained as it were, well he remained in the cabinet making trades, mm -hmm. sometimes the workers, sometimes independent, sometimes in the but anyway that was family trade. At least one of his sons uh, carried on for a while afterwards. Uh, the others didn't. I think it was in every respect a fairly undistinguished uh, family. Uh, it had no record of education, learning, business activity or business success, and uh, in fact, mostly it remained, the English part of it remained, as it were, on the very lowest slopes, just where workers had just emancipated themselves and become, you know, lower middle class or highly skilled. I mean, the sons became uh, post office workers, teachers, uh, that sort of thing. Only one actually managed somehow or other to get some kind of secondary education and he became a chemist and then emigrated and uh, eventually to Chile um, where most of the descendants were then of the Hobsbawms were then born. Uh, I was the first, I think, member of the family to go full-time to university. Uh, some, at least one of the others managed at the same time to do part-time higher education and worked their way up, eventually to become quite important, uh, my cousin, uh, Roland, quite an important statistician in the Ministry of Labour but starting right at the bottom, you see, man, minor manipulative grades, clerical grades, and then via various mm. exams. Mm. Uh, I was really the first, uh, first of the, the generation, and uh, the family didn't. Well, there's not not a great deal to be said, except mm. that it, it was a family which stuck together at least in, in England, a number of them left England for, because this was the era of imperialism, mm. for Egypt, two of the brothers went to Egypt, one went to Chile, yes, uh, mostly came back, but the basis of the English family remained. Uh, my Uncle Harry, who eventually became the first Labour Mayor of the Borough of Paddington, in, in London, 
who was a, uh, a, a telegraphist all his life, even during the war, the, the Great War, which he, he passed partly in the Western Front, and luckily for himself, after uh, the Italian defeat at Caporetto uh, in Egypt. So that. The mother's family was really sort of middle, middle class uh, business. My grandfather's trade was jewellery. They made jewels, but of course that collapsed after the First World War. My grandfather ended his career as no doubt he become, be began as a commercial traveller through Alpine villages with, you know, small things. But, um, but up to the end of the war, he was doing quite well, which is <coughs> the girls, it was a much more cultured family. My father's family, they, uh, the essence of their culture was that they assimilated to become very English. English as it possibly could, as fast as it could. And they succeeded quite largely. Uh, but uh, my mother's family shared Central European Habsburg culture. And I got a lot out of that. Uh, in in neither case were they very successful in material terms. Mm. Do you want anything more about the family? Yeah, well, I, I mean, you may not want to talk about it, but, we can, but um, I gather your father died when you were about 12 and your mother when you were about 14, is yes. that right? Yeah. I mean, is it worth mentioning that or at least asking, I mean, that's not absolutely normal even in at that time. How did that happen? Well, I've described this at some length in my autobiography, so I don't really want to go through it again. Uh, we'll just mention it then. And, and I mean, my, 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 my father effectively, uh, although he, uh, <coughs> he joined my mother after the First World War in Austria, because she was very nostalgic. Uh, and he brought some savings in hard currency there, which made him feel very successful. But he proved to be totally incapable of earning and a living in, on his own. He was one of these people who would have done extremely well, who had done extremely well in the sort of British colonial situation where a uh, good young man, very good at sports, he was actually championship class boxer, lightweight, uh, and with a certain amount of uh, you know, social graces, he played piano and that sort of stuff, could always find a job in some kind of import-export agency mm. or some kind of other office. And there was no, no real problem there. Um, but plunged into uh, Austria after the First World War and trying to make his own living as an independent businessman of some kind or other, never knew exactly what he was trying to do. He was a total failure put a lot of, lot of stress on the family, at least on my mother. And, I mean, this was very, very bad times indeed. Uh, and he, it drove him to desperation, and eventually, I mean, he, he died on some awful moment coming during a bad winter, coming back in front of the house. My mother could not forgive herself for, in fact, having berated him about not being able to give it. 
And this is a situation where, you know, she wrote to her sister before Christmas saying, I don't know what we should do at Christmas. I've got no, I haven't got enough money, let alone not to pay the gas bill, or let alone for, for present for the children. And uh, the mother then, uh, after his death, uh, in effect, uh, I, th I think she, uh, I won't say she committed suicide, but I mean she... Let herself die. She let herself, she, she what was working, what was going, and uh, I mean she, anyway, within a, a few months, she got a very bad infection, lung infection, and within two years she was very dead. But fortunately, of course, my father and mother, brother, had married uh, mm. each other's brother and sister. Mm. So, I mean, two sisters had married two brothers, mm. and I and my uh, sister were taken over by the uncle and aunt, who were, as it were, doubly close. And we then went to Berlin, where I stayed until we came to England. Is there anything about the character of either your own parents or the parents who took you over, which you think is important to stress, it, obviously relating to your later activities as a academic or historian? Were any of them very um, ambitious or literary or...? My mother was literary. I mean, in fact, she wrote a novel too in German and then translated. <coughs> um, I mean, the family's literary interests, I mean, intelligent young women in Vienna, for instance, they were great followers of Karl Kraus and mm. all the other people like that, and they circulated with other intellectual, intelligent mm. people. <coughs> uh, she wasn't ambit ambitious for herself. Would have been enough to earn enough money to get mm. by. I think she had hopes for me, but they were kind of romantic hopes. She once hoped, she hoped, for instance, and she was very, very Anglophile. Uh, and as I was interested in things like birds and stuff, she thought, oh, well, perhaps when he grows up, he can join the Indian Forestry Service. She was a <laughs> great admirer of Kipling, Jungle Book, and stuff like that. But beyond that, I don't think she had. And anyway, I mean, she, she died before there was really any, any mm. prospect of doing it. Mm. My, um, my father, I don't know anything about him. I mean, I don't remember anything about him effectively. And clearly, I didn't have very good relations with him. He tried to teach me boxing, and it didn't work. <laughs> well, My second father, if you like, and the other uncle, he, I think, had ambitions. He had ambitions for himself. Uh, he always wanted to be something other than simply a businessman. And I mean, he was always tried to be a businessman in either in music and show business and culture, you know. He always made some contact with some kind of operatic singer whom he wished to promote and uh, stuff like that. <coughs> but, uh, and eventually he talked himself into the movie business for a bit. And that's really what gave him his thrills. But his real ambition was that he was an extremely good chess player, which is how he got during World War I, he got onto, into intelligence during uh, but in those days, being an extremely good chess player was not uh, a, a professional qualification <laughs> for anything else. So there's nothing much he could do with it. Mm. 
but he did sort of realize that he thought that I was very bright and uh, he did his best to push me, though he had no idea of how to go about it. What is your first memory, I mean solid memory, beyond just the sun shining through your pram or whatever, but um, so a striking memory of your childhood? Well, as I say, in the relatively short period when my father still thought he had some money, we lived in uh, a, a very elaborate I mean, apartment, in a very elaborate villa, um, which you can still see as you come into Vienna from the, by train from the west. Uh, and there we were two families. And indeed, that was the sort of basis of family. I mean, uh, two, we made friends with local family, which were four girls. And of course, our own family used to come. So I can remember those meetings in the terrace. There was this uncle or that uncle turning up. That was very nice. And it's also, as I say in my autobiography, my first real political memory, though I didn't know it, uh, when uh, they, uh, in 1923, during the French occupation of the Ruhr, they evacuated German children from the Ruhr to places like Austria, you see, and one or two were in our class, and I took one into our garden and showed him how to climb a uh, favorite tree and so on, and he explained to me. Um, as I say, I remember the experience, but in retrospect, I can see that it was <laughs> a unique political, my first political experience, you see. Mm. Mm. What, uh, what was the first school you went to? Was that in Vienna? Primary, primary school in, in, in Vienna. In the, the suburb of Vienna, mm. yes. Just mm. in Hacking, yes. Do you remember anything about that? Any of the teachers or. No. Any? No, I don't remember any primary. Uh, mm. I remember the school, mm. very nice. Uh, I remember going around. Uh, they were very keen. Actually, it was quite a good backing for for history because uh, in, in effect there was a lot about the Viennese past and uh, people used to take us out for walks in the hills and say oh well here that maybe there is rec records of uh, cavemen and stuff like this and we used to go around chasing and say maybe we could find some fossil you know that kind of stuff and uh, insofar as we heard, heard about history, it wasn't about the boring things, you know, but about things like, you know, when the Turks uh, besieged Vienna after that and they left the coffee there, and that was the beginning of the coffee houses, you know, and that kind of stuff, you see, which registered. Mm. Well, mm. it's the sort of thing which does register with children, quite mm. unlike the official lists of kings and cabinets mm. and, and battles. Mm. Right. So to that extent. Uh, then after the, I went to three secondary schools in Vienna, things got disrupted after the death of my father. Uh, and then uh, a fourth in Berlin so I had a somewhat disrupted secondary education. Were there any teachers during that secondary period which, who influenced you a lot? I don't remember any uh, of the Austrian teachers, Quay teachers, except the last one in the 18th district, uh, because he was uh, at the same time a football commentator, and therefore known to be a football commentator, uh, Schmieger, uh, Max 
eventually this gave him a degree of profile, but I'm not certain that I developed any kind of personal relationship with any of them then. Uh, unlike the secondary school teachers in Berlin and in, later on in London. Mm. Uh, <coughs> How long were you at these uh, schools in Vienna? Or two years at the uh, school in the 13th district, one year at the 3rd district, which is just opposite the house Wittgenstein built himself, uh, one year in the 18th district. So there's a bit of a uh, disruption. Uh, and then, uh, 18 months, I suppose, in Berlin. What age were you when you came back to England, roughly? I was just coming up to, uh, I mean, you see, up to 16, maybe. Mm. Huh? What, you mentioned earlier that uh, you were interested in birds. I mean, were there other hobbies that, um, that were important? And what, I mean, it was, it, was it collecting birds' eggs or was it looking at birds or...? Oh, just uh, looking at birds, uh, not so much collecting birds' eggs, no. Uh, <coughs> I mean, I, I still remember, it's, again, I mentioned it in my autobiography, the last time I saw my mother, who was dying in the sanatorium, and other people were around, and I was, didn't quite know what to do, and I looked out of the window and I saw a hawfinch, which is one of the ones, you know, these huge beaks, which can, mm. in German, it's called Kirschkernbeißer, a uh, cherry stone biter, you see, huh? And that is, in a sense, my <laughs> last living memory of my mother uh, while she was there dying and me looking out at this bird. Uh, um, you weren't a sportsman at times, or a sports person? Not much. No, I joined the Boy Scouts hmm. in the last year, coming back. After my father died, I visited England there was some hope I might stay in England with uh, another sister of my mother's, but it didn't work out. Uh, and, but nevertheless, I mean, I acquired a taste for the Boy Scouts and joined them when I went back to Vienna. Uh, <coughs> uh, I might have stuck with the Boy Scouts if there had been any in Germany, but there weren't. It mentions that, this may be apocryphal, but I think in one of the articles on you, it mentions that you became an au pair and taught English. That sounds rather bizarre. No, not at all. I mean, uh, it's a bit difficult. You see, after my mother got ill and therefore, in effect, got into hospital, couldn't look after anybody, uh, my uncle and uh, aunt took my sister, already took my sister to Berlin, you see. Uh, I stuck around in Vienna for another year or so, but uh, at one time I was supposed to live with some relatives and then somehow that, that didn't last. So they arranged, somebody arranged uh, to put me into the house of a lady not too far from the new school, where, in effect, I was supposed to talk English to or to to, to the uh, the young boy, mm. uh, Mrs. Effenberger, who was some kind of officer's widow, originally born in Bohemia, uh, and uh, I did that, and then I used to go and visit my mother in hospital every week, or so. Uh, <coughs> not a very successful year. 
Were any of your, either your real parents or your later adopted parents, um, and they were all Jewish, but were any of them, were they secularized Jews or practicing? Totally. I mean, uh, I don't think I ever went to a synagogue uh, except for funerals. I may have gone once for somebody's wedding, but I mean, uh, <clears throat> as far as I'm aware, uh, my father's generation was also pretty completely secularized. So, I mean, religion wasn't... Uh, um, they didn't have any of the uh, um, commemorations or uh, feasts or uh, abstentions or anything? No. No, not at all. I mean, uh, it was so secularized that uh, I, I didn't even know until I got, uh, until I reached puberty that I'd been circumcised, which is what my mother had done, in, uh, you know, because her, her, her parents still insisted to some extent. Um, I mean, I was never, I was never bar mitzvahed. I mean, I got some Jewish instruction by, because uh, the, the Jews in school uh, were dispensed from, you know, uh, they, they went and, and got some religious instructions somewhere in the afternoon in another school by a series of people. But, uh, I mean, they even taught me bits and pieces of uh, the sort of thing you're supposed to, you know, still know some of the things you're supposed to say in, at the Passover, the young, youngest son. I've never used it. I've never attended a Seder in my life. Or done any. So, I mean, there's no, no question about religion mm. or religious practice. Uh, but at the same time, of course, it was uh, completely clear to anybody in Central Europe whether you were Jewish or not, because I mean, the rest of the world regarded Jews as people being Jewish and different. Uh, as I tried to explain, my main uh, principle on, on, on uh, religion is the one which was inculcated by my mother at some time when she heard me making some kind of uh, undesirable remark about this sort of Jewish behavior which one of my uncles or somebody else had done. He says, you must never under any circumstances say anything or do anything that might suggest that you're ashamed of being Jewish. And that was enough, really. So in some ways, I mean, for instance, I mean, normally, in Austria, in between the wars, it was legally possible at the age of reaching the age of 13 to de declare yourself confessionslos, without faith, without religion, which of course I would have done, except for this principle, <laughs> that you know, nobody, well, that, that it, it must not be misunderstood, you know, that kind of business. Um, but I don't think beyond that is, uh, is it does, uh, alas, it doesn't mean that uh, one, one wasn't part of the Jewish problem or involved in mm. these matters, uh, but not from the point of view of uh, traditional religion and uh, uh, practice, religious practice. Do, do you, th I mean, some people have speculated that um, in some ways, being Jewish and being aware of it has influenced the way you've looked at things like nationalism or the invention of tradition or whatever. Do you think that is the case? I know I, when I, why I ask this is that I've a number of, obviously, of the distinguished people I've talked to, like Lisa Jardine or Simon Schaffer and others, have. Um, wondered about whether being both within 
society and outside at the same time has, has made them more self-aware and aware of constraints of their, the culture they live in. Difficult to judge uh, for, from my own point of view. Uh, <coughs> I mean, especially as, on the whole, and while I was engaged in either in history or in political activities, I didn't very much see myself, you know, I mean, being Jewish was not a thing that's particularly significant. In some ways, I mean, I sympathize very much with the view when uh, that Gombrich, the art historian, expressed when somebody said, can you tell us about the Jewish culture of Vienna? And he said, there was no Jewish culture of Vienna. I was brought up in the middle class culture of Vienna. And the fact that the people who practiced it were Jewish is, yes. is not, didn't seem to him. Uh, so, seen from outside, it may, I mean, I think it's fairly clear that having lived a life between cultures and moving from one place to another, or if you like, being member of a king group which was distributed over various areas of this globe in Europe and elsewhere does give you a slightly different angle on nations and nationalism uh, but it doesn't actually make you as you know immune to nationalism because I mean all I can say is uh, I never fell for the Jewish nationalism, possibly because it seemed to me to be too much the opposite number to the German nationalism uh, which surrounded me. <coughs> mm. Just the Zionism. Of course. Yes, yes. Um, I mean, just to finish on this sort of uh, area, um, did religion? become important at all to you later in your life in any way or did you is it something you're interested in or was it just something that wasn't really relevant of course I'm interested in it mm. uh, and indeed I mean <coughs> it's something which uh, clearly you know uh, one comes across in one's work mm. I mean I came across it in one's work very much, for instance, when I was working on uh, the pre-political movements of social protest. Mm. The language the practice, uh, in which they spoke was a religious language. Uh, I would also say that, I mean, one would recognize the, the force of religious sentiment in some cases uh, it's very clear for instance insofar as I got interested in jazz and black music and so on with uh, gospel and uh, spirituals and stuff like this were genuinely expressions of something that was uh, profoundly important to the people concerned, even though it wasn't profoundly important to me. So to this extent, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not anti, I mean, I, I, I don't reject this, I accept it this. To me personally, religion hasn't, no. I mean, it's, it's uh, as far as I can see. Uh, Let's bring you to England then, at about the age of 16. And you, where did you go to school there? I went to school, um, I, mean I, st I stayed at first. Uh, the, the family moved into the bits and pieces. I first stayed with uh, this uncle, the telegraphist, mm. Uncle Harry. 
and he arranged for me to go to the school where his son had gone to, which is St. Melbourne Grammar School, which uh, lasted well. It, it was a very good school. I mean, it, it, it was one of those, uh, it was a London County Council school in those days. Uh, it tried, and it's based, tried to follow the basic style of public schools, which irritated a number of us enormously. But it was a very good school, uh, at least for people coming. I mean, I can remember the first interview with the headmaster, was a man called Philip Wayne, who eventually produced a translation of Faust for the Penguin classics, I think, uh, <coughs> who apologized to me that they said, we shan't be able to, treat, to teach you Greek because we only teach Latin here. Eventually the school tried, to, we got to teach him Greek, but by that time it was too late. But then he immediately pressed into me, he said, uh, yes. now here's this volume of Kant, you might be interested in this. <laughs> and the other thing I remember immediately, he said, you must read Hazlitt. Huh? So, I mean, it was very clear that uh, this is a man who, who was, I think he obviously thought, you know, this is, I looked fairly promising. But at all events, uh, these were people who clearly uh, took an interest in and were good at um, I managed to uh, get through the, uh, uh, what in those days called the matric, which would nowadays be called uh, GCSEs, in about two or three months. It was, uh, never having done these things before, but I mean, I sort of worked on these things uh, for the first few months and managed to do that, so I could go straight into uh, uh, well, effectively six, you see, huh? Um, um, and uh, the arts, six. So, um, uh, I'm bound to say I owe them a great deal because, I mean, if you ever somebody who's come, who'd never been to an English school, who'd never actually never actually knew much English except domestic English, you see, home, home English. I mean, read things, but there weren't that many. Uh, uh, and to manage within a matter of two or three years to get up to uh, where I was when I got up to Cambridge was really quite an achievement for the school, I think. With the help I must say, with the help of the public library, the Marlborough Public Library, I mean, I'm sure that anybody of that my age, and perhaps even later, the public library was an institution which was absolutely central for really widening, uh, for, for, for education as well as self-education. Uh, Fortunately, it was around the corner from the school, so I used to go to the library and get new books in, in the lunch break and all sorts of things. But the combination of a good, good teaching and the public library uh, was really, uh, I won't say it was a making of me, but it, I, I don't see what I would have done if I hadn't had this. Were there any teachers at that school who you particularly remember as? Oh yes, yeah. At that stage, mm. I, mean, I remember some of the German teachers. Mm. I remember, curious enough, I remember the German headmaster better than mm. others, who was uh, again, who on the whole was very critical and criticised my style. In those days, my interests were literary rather than anything else. Certainly not historical, because I mean the historical teaching at this German school was absolutely useless, you know, I mean, dates of German emperors and stuff like this. 
the, the terrible irony of the situation was the man taught us all this stuff, you know, going around the same, saying, you know, uh, Henry the Fowler dates, you know, mm. wham, you know, that kind of stuff, was actually an extremely distinguished ancient historian and archaeologist who had contributed, you know, to Pauli Visava, mm. and who was at least as bored with the stuff that he was. Uh, and, but I was in too low a form for me to be able to, to recognize that these people really were prepared to talk. Now, they weren't yet prepared to talk to people at that age mm. yet. Uh, well, the headmaster was, in a curious way, he was, he was almost immediately sacked by the Nazis as a Republican. Not that he was left wing, it was simply a. But. Um, and I remember those. I mean, uh, I remember Were there any history teachers at the English school who. The history teacher at the English school <coughs> was not, I think, a particularly good historian, <coughs> but he uh, did everything he could for me. Uh, he was actually a man called Harold Llewellyn Smith, the son of the Llewellyn Smith, who uh, was a very big figure in the uh, Edwardian civil servant and eventually uh, the head of the New London Survey at the LAC. I mean, a very important figure, one of his sons, <coughs> and in fact, uh, liberal. Uh, who did everything, I mean, he, he, he had good connections, I mean, he used to send my essays to the webs to check that kind of stuff. Uh, but, I mean, he obviously uh, had his books, which were available to, to those who read. So, he, he, he did his best. I didn't really learn very much history from him, because it wasn't his kind of history. But at the same time, uh, I mean, when I came to Cambridge, I discovered, you know, the stuff that was being taught there was totally different from anything that you know, mm. happened in secondary school. Um, on the other hand, I mean, I, without him, I would certainly not have got uh, gone to Cambridge. I mean, because he knew he knew the ropes. He knew what to do to get scholarship, you know, to, to sit scholarship exams, whether it was, he gave me the right kind of tips. In Cambridge, you've got to put down Kings first. In Oxford, you've got to put down Balliol first, you know, that kind of stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. So, from that point of view, he was really very, very uh, decisive. Although, I mean, I'm most interested in teaching, not from him, but from the English people, mm. the English teachers. Were there any other things you were doing at school by then, like debating or uh, acting or music or other societies? Well, yes, there was debating, sure. I mean, there was a debating club, I even at one stage, one debating cup. Mm. Uh, <coughs> that was uh, they they tried to get me onto uh, sports, but as I'd never done any cricket and started off at uh, 16, uh, also I didn't show any great enthusiasm for it. It was not an enormous... Curious enough, in Germany, you see, I'd been very sporting, I did rowing. We had a one marvellous boat club. Uh, but in, in England, I tried looking for the boat club again in Cambridge, and then I discovered that you had to, you're supposed to spend all the afternoon there, and that wasn't, <laughs> didn't, didn't strike me. I mean, uh, mm. however, uh, no, uh, I spent a good deal of time cycling and, uh, you know, wandering around England and so on with, 
a cousin who was my closest friends, and we made huge trips through the country, camping and all that kind of stuff. Why, why did you, I mean, you went to Ca King's and Cambridge because of the history teacher? Was I went to King's and Cambridge because I won a scholarship. That was the first examination, and I, I, I got through hmm. the scholarship examination. Otherwise, I would have tried Oxford. Hmm. And what date was this that you went to King's? Hmm? What date did you go to King's? Well, I did a scholarship examination in 35, hmm. and I went up in 36. And your teachers at that time, I mean, the generation of Oscar Browning had gone, and gone. Uh, Christopher, was he then there by that time? Christopher Morris? Or? Yes. Morris, Saltmarsh, and uh, Balfour. Balfour, completely forgotten now. Mm. Uh, of these, Salt Marsh was a genuine scholar, knew an enormous amount. Uh, I didn't learn as much as I could from him, but I mean, I admired him for sheer learning something. Christopher Morris, I, Christopher Morris was very good because he asked what he called was Socratic questions, which is quite good for bright undergraduates. What do you mean by when you say this, checking out what you're trying to do? Didn't actually teach anything. No, the only persons that in Cambridge, I mean, I went around throughout all day lectures and tried them pretty well all at one time. Uh, the only ones that we that I really stayed with is Postine. Insofar as I can say that there was somebody in Cambridge that, as it were, uh, in, if not interested me, but I mean was a teacher uh, it must have been Poster. Just his lectures? He didn't supervise you? Only when I got to be graduate. Mm. Then he was no good. <laughs> well? Uh, no, he didn't supervise. Well, I mean, after I graduated, he joined his sort of seminar and stuff like this. But, mm. but basically, it was lectures. I mm. mean, he was the man that all the really bright young historians went to. Mm. The economic. It was a marvellous very clever man. I mean, a fantasist, or if you like, a liar. <laughs> but uh, whatever it was, one of his fantasies was that he knew everything. Uh, so he never, there was never a question to which he claimed, I don't know the answer, which is very dangerous. As distinct from, say, you know, I remember at one time going and talking in Harvard to Gershenkron, mm. who was also a Russian, saying, and in some ways, at least, it was more solid actual achievement, uh, who didn't hesitate to say, if I ask him some questions, I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that. Um, were there others at King's? I mean, this is the time of John Maynard Keynes and Provost Shepherd, perhaps. And were there any other King's fellows who, at that time, you came into contact with? E.M. Forster was probably there then. No, not until after the war. I mean, got to know. I got to know Morgan after the war, mm. pretty well, actually. Mm. Um, I can't say. I mean. King Kings was enormously tolerant, uh, but uh, uh, even of not very good looking uh, people from grammar schools who were heterosexual, or at least who were not homosexual. But nevertheless, uh, I don't really think in Kings I was ever 
as it were, socially. This was a time when kings were socially rising very, very high in the top. I didn't really know very many of the uh, the fellows mm. uh, seriously. Uh, I mean, I was never invited to join the Ten Club and things like mm. that. You know, that kind of thing. On the other hand, as between various students. Uh, Kings was particularly good because, I mean, you know, relationships were very close and very, uh, uh, probably the best thing, historically speaking, uh, the, the only other man in Kings that uh, had some kind of influence was old Clapham, yes. who still presided over a thing called the political society, which yeah. was, as it were, a meeting of the history class students. Do they, do they have the custom then that after a talk, they handed round a purse and you had to pick out a number, and depending on which number you picked, you were the first person to ask a question or a second. This was certainly the case in later on in the political society. Can't remember. Probably yes. Mm. I can't remember. The political society was very good. Mm. I mean, and, and because, I mean, you got together with it, and frankly, I find one learned much more from one's own contemporaries and mm. from libraries in Cambridge, and particularly all these discussions which you had, you know, the socialists, the Marxists and so on, you know, that there was an enormous amount of debates and talks and readings. So um, when when did you become a, an apostle? Was it when you were an undergraduate or later? I was the last uh, election before the war. So you'd, you'd left Cambridge or? No, still in Cambridge. Because that takes you into the higher echelons of... Yes, that's when I discovered that there were higher echelons. <laughs> <laughs> huh? Yes. And were there any apostles who you got to know well at that time? Well, I mean, I got to know much later because after that the war almost immediately started. So, yeah. I mean, uh, in, in, in fact, I de facto restarted the apostles in Cambridge after the war because I was, there were very few of the pre-war mm. people left and so to restart the... Mm. Uh, but the angels, the mm. older members were still around and I got to know a lot of them then. Mm. And very, very obviously, Morgan Forster. Mm. Uh, <coughs> uh, but then all these various other uh, uh, fellows who, who'd, whom I wouldn't have known. So I, I, I never met Keynes before the war, but then, of course, being neither an economist nor in the sort of social gratin, mm. uh, uh, I wouldn't have. Mm. And you mentioned Morgan, and he's really in the, after the war, but perhaps it would be worth just uh, dwelling on him in a moment now. Um, what, what was he like? Difficult to define. Certainly, I mean, he seemed a hangover from um, um, uh, a past generation. I mean, both in his way, the way in which he behaved, his reactions. <coughs> uh, um, I think, in some ways, uh, he, I mean, he had two really uh, great uh, loyalties. Uh, <coughs> one.
one, I think, was essential to friendship. And the other, of course, being homosexual, mm. was, you know, that was enormously important to him in some ways. Um, it's very interesting that you should ask me this question because looking back, I can't really give him retrospectively a sort of shape. I mean, I can see his behavior. I can see him behaving. I can see him doing, I mean, my relations with him. I see him coming to visit me when I was ill, like up there in Kip's building, fairly regularly. Uh, I don't think we ever really seriously talked about it. I can see myself uh, taking him in London to uh, things that you would not normally be expected. You remember the establishment club? Huh? Mm. I took him to that huh? and then took him back to his flat somewhere in the west and pulled him away thereabouts. It was most polite. Very nice and 